Ryan, what are you doing? I'm just hanging out. And we invite you to hang out for a new episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, the weather this year has driven me a little batty. So coming up on the show today, we'll learn a little bit more about bats and why they're good for the garden. Also coming up in the show today, we'll talk about the different kinds of lavender. And we'll be visiting a lily flower festival. But coming up first, Jan's tips of the month. It is mid-July and we are ready with tips with Jan. And so Jan, you obviously have so much information. What should we be looking at this month? Well, I've gotten quite a few questions about my zucchini blossoms. There's a lot of blossoms on it. There's no zucchini coming. Uh, the male blossoms always come first and then they pollinate the female blossoms that come and that's when you see the fruit. Uh, so you're gonna see a longer stem is a male blossom. And we're going to look at this one right here. Right. This is a male blossom. See the long stem on it? Oh, okay. And this is, these are going to be female blossoms. And here's one already oh, you see the that has the little tiny zucchini right there. Cool. So it's going to be way shorter. And then a lot of times there'll be a lot of male blossoms. They'll drop off. The female blossoms haven't come yet. And then you'll end up starting to get fruit. Uh. And Really, it's really never a problem to not get any zucchini. Eventually <laughs> it happens, depends on when you planted them. Of course, of course, and yeah. somebody you know has zucchini, yes, so don't exactly, fret. Yes, exactly. And then you have this Brugmansia here, so what's going on? Well, first of all, it's hungry because it's a little on the yellow side, so it needs some fertilizer, but it's a really good example of if you water often, the root system of plants come to the surface. And if you water deeply and less often, they'll go lower. And this one gets watered a lot because it, it reacts to the heat. But it's a good example. I've put, twice I've put new mulch on the top layer of that and the root system is right there. So I'm going to transplant that into a bigger pot and put maybe a couple inches of mulch on the top so it holds its water a little better. But it's like that with, with anything. really anything right. if you're watering. But a lot of times we've had to water often this year. Mm -hmm. But it's like if you have a, an irrigation system that turns on at five in the morning for 10 minutes, yeah. uh, you better keep doing that and even more because what happens is the root system, even of the grass, comes high. And then if you don't water a day or two, you're gonna get browning. Right. So it's like that with pretty much anything. Right. So the moral of the story is slower, deeper water. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. And then about identifying things that we don't know about before we do any kind of action. Right. Um, you have to know if, a, if a, what's bothering you is a disease or an insect or environmental or whatever. Try to identify the problem before you treat because you may not have to treat at all. Uh, it may be something if you've got browning on one leaf, pick it off. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> to do uh, other than that. There's a OSU Ask an Expert. Uh, you can send any kind of questions in uh, for that. Another question I've had is like, there's these yellow and black <laughs> larvae all over my whatever. It can be a chrysanthemum, but mostly you'll see it on tansy. And tansy ragwort is an invasive, noxious weed. The cinnabar moth is black in sort of a iridescent blue, black, and red. red yeah. uh, but the larva is yellow and black. Uh, so know what you have because those guys are, do they've been introduced to eat the tansy. Right. And so that'll help uh, control that. So there's a lot of different things to just make sure you know what you have. Right. And then what about sun scald? I mean, that's on everybody's top t top list sure. these days. Well, there's deciduous plants which lose their leaves in the fall and a lot of those fried, but they're gonna come back because they're gonna lose their leaves this fall and next spring they're gonna be fine. With evergreens, you may get some south side burning. Um, don't prune anything yet. Those dead leaves will fall off later and at the ends, tips of the branches, it'll green up again. So try not to do that. Um, this is a tomato sun scald. 
uh, that, I mean, it looks that, fine, that, sure. Yeah, and it, it's going to ripen. I could take it in the house and it'll ripen even more and just cut off the sun scald. Right, it's not a disease. No, and don't but worry if you have it. a black at the bottom and not the south side, oh, right. it's a. Uh, uh, blossom end rot. It's bloody, thanks. And we'll talk about it's that soon. Blossom end, <laughs> a blossom end rot, and you just need more calcium when you plant. Right. She is a wealth of information. Every week, every month that we come, we learn something new. But really, go to the OSU site. There's always information, and you can even write in questions and get your answers within just a few days. Jan, thanks so much. You're welcome. See you next month. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. I'm out here at Backyard Bird Shop. I'm with Darlene. And, you know, a couple weeks ago, Darlene, we were out at the Japanese Garden, and a bat, you know, decided that he liked Judy and landed on Judy's back, So, which was kind of surprising. You know, and it seems like bats, a lot of times, we freak out when we see a bat. But that's not necessarily a bat, you know, thing, right? Right, right. So bats are often misunderstood. Um, they have a history of being understood. Folks they are afraid of them. We used to hear that they were going to go into your hair and bite you. All of these are bat myths. Um, they're actually very beneficial. They're one of the most beneficial animals on earth. Really? Yeah. Because yeah, you hear about like, you know, rabies and you, know, you, right. you kind of freak out, but that's not necessarily... You know, just like raccoons, not every bat has rabies. In fact, very few do. And so it's not really something that you're going to come across very often. Now, bats have some pretty amazing senses. They do. They have echolocation ability and they are adapted so well that they can actually see a single strand of hair at night. So when you see bats around and they're coming close, they know exactly where you are. They're not going to hit you. And as far as a mammal, they're the only mammal that flies. They hang upside down to sleep and rest. They're really unique. You know, so there's a lot of benefits of having bats in your yard. Yeah. What, what are some of those benefits? Well, you know, there's a lot. There's insect pest consumption. They eat millions of pounds of insects and they help reduce crop failure, which is a huge savings to our farmers, plant pollination and seed dispersal. So they're vital to the genetic diversity and the regeneration of tropical rainforests. They're important to medical research. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of studies. There's all kinds about. of things being studied about bats and where they benefit us on a medical basis. You know, and not all bats are created equal. We have you know, different types of bats here in the Northwest, right? Here we have, in the U.S., we have 15 species, excuse me, 47 species of bats, 15 in Oregon, and eight here in our area. Oh, very interesting. So, you know, if we you know, want to try to attract bats to our garden, yeah. you know, what, what do we need in our yard to attract them? So, um, here's the deal. You can put in a pond. That's quite a bit, maybe for some folks. But you can also plant a garden for bats. Um, there are flowers, you guys would yeah, know, yeah, right. the flowers that release their scent at nighttime. So you can turn on your outdoor lights and then um, avoid using pesticides. And right. then the easiest thing for all of us to do is put up a bat house. Right. And so you have you know, a really nice selection of, of bat houses and bat you know, apparatus here at, at, yeah. the store, at your stores. So when we're trying to pick out a bat house, what do we need to look for? for well, to um, ideally a bat house for, is going to be about two feet tall, 15 inches wide, and it will have multiple chambers. The chambers should be no more than one inch apart. Okay. And so the reason for that height is on a hot day, they can come down to where there's more ventilation, but on a cold day, they can get up near the ceiling where the heat is trapped and they're gonna be much more comfortable. Okay. Is there a good placement of about where we should put those in our yard? For sure, yes. So you want to be able to put them at least 15 feet high, okay. but perhaps most important is morning sun. Morning sun is going to warm those bats at the coldest time of day. And if you can, put it in a location that is going to have six hours of sunlight. 
Yeah. Well, you guys have, you know, out here at your backyard bird shops, you know, you carry, a, have a nice selection of just, just for bats. Yes. And you have a lot of information on your website, too, we about, do. about how to bring bats to your garden and their benefits. And you can always come into any backyard bird shop and talk to their knowledgeable staff about bats and why the benefits of bringing those bats to your garden is a great thing. So, Darlene, it's been great to be out here and educate us on, you know, the myths about bats and how they're great for the garden. So, thanks for having us today. Thank you. Well, today we're talking lavenders. We're out here at Blooming Junction. I'm with Billy Joe, and Billy Joe, you have a wide selection of lavenders. You know, I can smell them. They smell great, and we all know lavenders, but there are a lot of different varieties. And you have looks like you have some of your favorites picked out here. And so, what what do we have? For I I do. Um, we have the English lavenders here. We've got Munstead and the Hidcoat. Um, these are the Angustifolias. Um, this is one of the hardiest and easiest to grow varieties. And this is what people use for um, making products and... Yeah, and I mean, because it looks like they have that, that kind of that traditional lavender, lavender bloom. Yes. And you know, then you know, we move down, down the row and these are a little bit different looking. Which, which kinds are these? These are different. These are the Spanish lavenders, um, also referred to as French lavenders. And you can tell the difference because they have these uh, spiked inflorescence on top. Yeah, it looks like little wings. Yes. You know, and the, I can see some varying differences in between some colors. You know, you got a lot of lavender color, but these are a little bit more pink. Is there a lot of differences between lavenders as far as the shades of the color? You can get different colored leaves and flowers in any variety. Um, you can see the silver anuk here is a Spanish lavender. Um, and then uh, the Anouk Supreme, very different color foliage, right. but they're still Spanish lavenders. Yeah, and even this one has a lot, little, lot softer, l lacier looking than, than these, but yes. they're all Spanish. Those are all Spanish. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then these, what about these guys down here? Those are the intermedias. Um, in the front we've got Grasso, and then back here is the Provence. Um, those are the big hitters. That is what people really go for when they're making essential oils and making products. You get a much higher yield of essential oils. Interesting. And you know, and it looks like you know the blooms are have much longer, longer spikes on them too. Yeah, you can get some really long stems. Makes it really good for um, you know for cutting if you want those those long. Yes. You know, and you know, since there's a lot of differences between you know, all the different lavenders, what about care? Do they all require the same same care? Yes, they all need a really sunny location, um, really good drainage. Water them well the first year and then you really don't have to worry about them. Oh, nice. So they're pretty, pretty durable. You know, winter-wise, you know, sometimes you'll see lavenders in landscapes that have kind of gotten kind of big and, and flopped open. Is there ways to, for pruning? For yes, I always recommend that uh, at least the end of the first year you prune them back into a nice little dome shape and um, that'll set the stage for good, uh, a good size shrub, okay. or a good shaped shrub for years to come. And then, you know, hardy, hardiness between, between the different ones, you know, here, here in the Northwest, you know, are all of them as, as hardy or are there some that are a little bit? All of these are pretty hardy here. Um, they can handle down to zero, maybe some below zero temperatures. Um, okay. The fern leaf ones are not as hardy, but pretty much everything else is. As, as, as able to survive the, this Northwest conditions. Yeah. And you guys grow quite a few different varieties, right? Quite a few. I think we have 20 on hand. Right now, but yeah. I think there's, you know, the, in the lavender world, you know, I think there's probably hundreds of, of varieties, right? Yes, and we do have you pick. Oh, you have Yupik lavender too. Yes, we do. You know, better, better yet. You know, so for more information on the lavenders and how to come out here and you can Yupik, or which variety would work best in, in your garden, make sure you come out and talk to Billy Joe and her staff out of here at Blooming Junction and get all the information on lavenders. So for more information, go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over. So Billy Joe, it's been a pleasure to come out here and learn all about the different types of lavender. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. At Portland Nursery, we believe that gardening is a creative endeavor that enriches our experience, enlivens the spaces around us, and provides a safe haven for the mind. 
Portland Nursery has everything you need to make your space feel unique, inviting, and exciting. From house plants and hedges to trees, tools, veggies, and herbs, our selection is always growing and changing, just like you. Come visit us today at 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. You can use water wisely this summer with these simple tips. Periodically, check your watering system to make sure it is working correctly. Tighten hose connections and adjust sprinklers to water plants and not the pavement. Give your lawn and garden a deep soak twice weekly instead of watering daily. Skip the fertilizer until the fall and mow your lawn less often. Taller grass holds moisture in longer between waterings. Get more water-wise gardening tips at regionalh2o.org. I am at a most unusual festival. I am surrounded by lilies. It's the Lily Market slash festival, and I'm with Ken, the owner. And Ken, I don't know of many places that sell this many lilies. You're very lucky here. Yes, we are, and uh, we're the only festival west of the Mississippi River. Oh, wow, in the wow. United States. And I could see that because so. this is just amazing. The color's a little early this year, but oh, the colors are fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, I, once again, I call them the happy flower because they're, they're always smiling and they make people smile when they see them. That is true. And so many different colors and different shapes, mm -hmm. different heights. So yep. really you have some for almost any kind of a garden these days. Yes, yes we do. You can, you can plant the um, miniatures or the semi-miniatures such as lollipop along your sidewalk or along another small plant or something like that. And then you can do the, the tall one like Red Sensation or the other ones. Uh, the new one here is pretty much the same size. You can plant those in the back of something small, and they just make everything pop uh, when, they, when they're when they in bloom. And so when we're here, we can kind of see what they look like, see that actual color, and then get a pot to take home, which right. is so great. Uh -huh. So then how do we take care of them once we get them home? Well, what we'd like to have our people do is uh, dig the hole about a little larger than the pot and a little wider and then put in some uh, potting mix which we sell here that's been developed specifically for lilies and uh, plant that cover it up and then water, give it a little bit of water and just uh, let it go through the to the um, the rest of the summer oh right right sure <laughs> the rest of the summer and uh, don't over water them uh, i tell people just water them once a week so you don't want to plant them somewhere where there's going to be standing water or the, you're, you're watering your lawn maybe every day. You don't want to do right. that, otherwise the bulb rots. And then if I want to cut them to take them in, because they're such a great cut flower, do I want to leave some of the foliage to kind of nourish that bulb for yeah, next year? Yeah, you want to leave about uh, four inches above ground when you cut the uh, stem for the uh, bouquet. And uh, that's, that's it. You can leave them in, in the ground over winter here as long as it's not as long as they're not planted somewhere where it's going to remain wet over the winter. That's the main thing. Yeah. And really when we come out, we can pick up potted um, plants too, but you also have bouquets for sale. Yes, Which we are do. just amazing. Yeah, yeah they, they are. My wife puts those together and she does a fabulous job on those. So Ken, the festival is kicking off this weekend. So how long is it going for? What are the hours? Uh, the hours are 10 till 5. And uh, this the first week is Saturday through Sunday. And then after that, it's Thursday through Sunday, 10 to 5. Ah. Well, really, there's plenty of time to come up because it'll be lasting for a couple more weeks until the flowers are all bloomed out? Yeah, uh, approximately one month. Um, some of these we got in late, so they may go a little, little longer. But uh, generally, what I tell people is we're going to we'll update the website, which Perfect. is lilyflowerfest.com. Uh, when we know for sure what, what the last day is going to be or the road signs, when those road signs are gone, then we're, we're done. Ah. Well, you know, going to the Garden Time website and then we'll click over to that website and you can get the up-to-date information to come out and enjoy all of these lilies, but to always take them home for your own enjoyment. Thanks so much, Ken. Yeah, thank you very much for coming out. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Welcome to the brand new Capital Subaru. We've taken a big step forward 
we've built one of the most unique Subaru dealerships in the U.S. And we know you're gonna love it. There's so much to see and do here, like shop at our exclusive pet store. And unwind in one of our amazing new lounge spaces. Or race through the obstacle course at our new dog park. This place is pretty stinking cool. <laughs> it's time to discover again, with over 72,000 square feet just for you. Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Little Baja is your source for a whole lot of terracotta and concrete too. From bird baths and benches to Buddhas, bears and fountains, plus the exclusive Baja chimney, we have an amazing variety of the finest in terracotta and concrete containers. Come check out our selection of statuary for any garden theme or setting. So for something for the garden, deck or patio, come see us at Little Baja on East Burnside in Portland. Find us on Facebook too. Well, you know, we're getting into the heat of the summer and we want our plants to look great. I'm with Steve Carper from the Regional Water Providers Consortium with tips for all of us. So we really want to make our gardens and our lawns look great. So what kind of tips do you have for us? Well, you know, things have really progressed in the last few years in terms of technology for the yard. And there's some really great new controllers out there that make things really simple at a great price point and oh, use the weather conditions to make scheduling adjustments. But if you're not quite ready to make that leap in terms of your budget, there's also always great simple adjustments that you can do to your sprinkler systems to make things make sure that what you have is performing really well. Uh, so we'll talk about that. All right. And you know, sometimes those systems are on in the middle of the night or early in the morning. So really, we need to be out in our gardens and seeing what's going on. That's exactly right. So, you know, once or twice a year, turn your system on and walk through and observe how things are performing. And we're going to talk about some really, again, typical things that you want to make adjustments for to right. help improve. Let's see. So one of the first things you want to do, um, sprinklers are out in the landscape and things change and so they can tilt and get out of alignment which then means maybe the water's not going to spray where you really intended it to. So there's some simple things that you can do in terms of correcting that. A handy little trowel, dig around the side of the sprinkler, pull out just enough dirt to let you sort of manipulate the head to get it basically vertical with the grade. Then the other thing that you can do if the water is not necessarily spraying the right direction, you can simply while it's performing grab a hold of this stem and gently give it a twist to make sure that things are aligned properly. And then with depending on the type of uh, nozzle that you have, you can also make very simple adjustments to the radius, the how far the water is going. You really ideally want water from each sprinkler nozzle to reach the other sprinkler next to it. We call sure. it head-to-head -head coverage. Okay. So for actually this type of head, this is called a uh, multi-stream rotator. There's a special type of a tool that you flip over the top here and you can just sort of just twist it clockwise, counterclockwise, and that will adjust again the arc to get, for example, a half circle or a quarter circle, whatever it is. If you're spraying your lawn, you just want to kind of turn the left side to align with the left border right. and then you put the tool on and open it or constrict it to align with the right side. Right. And then for example if my sprinkler is spraying too far or not far enough then there's a little screwdriver tip that fits into the top of that nozzle and turning it to the right is going to constrict the flow, kind of the old righty tighty lefty yeah, loosey. Yeah. Oh, good, good. <laughs> so turning it to the right will sort of tighten things down, will constrict the radius to a smaller uh, throwing radius and turning it to the left will open it up as far as it will go. There's generally three types of nozzle. Greater capacity to go farther and farther. It's usually a, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 okay, sure. series sort of a thing. Um, and then also another thing if say for example you're watering an area and the uh, plants have gotten mature they don't need as much water or perhaps any more supplemental water you can simply tighten that down all the way and essentially shut this sprinkler wow. off without having to necessarily dig it up, cap it off, and do more work than you're comfortable doing. Right. Um, so that's another thing to really keep in mind. Um, a third thing we want to talk about is perhaps you don't have this really efficient type of nozzle. Oh, sure. I've seen these. These are the older types. Yeah. So it's really a simple upgrade. And, you know, when, it's perf when, the, when the sprinkler is up like this and you can sort of get your fingers down in there and, and lift it up when it's not performing or operating. It can be a little bit tricky, but simply... Oh, it's that easy, right? Just turn it to the left. It's, it's usually just on there finger tight. Pull that nozzle out, and then you would grab the other nozzle, mm -hmm. and it has its own filter in there, and that screen just keeps the, uh, the orifice from getting clogged up when it's operating. 
drop Change it down in there. If you're buying new ones, you just want to make sure if it's, if these threads are male or female that right. you that the nozzles that you get are compatible. Compatible, built the same way. Screw it back on there, and it's really handy. You can sort of see that the no the nozzle indicates what the pattern is. Mm -hmm. So that helps you once you have it back in place to sort of turn things, things to the going. right alignment. So again, that you're spraying the water where it needs to go. So Steve, those are great tips about changing the heads, but what if we want to go to that next level of great irrigation? Well, there's another thing you can do. Uh, you may have noticed in the last few weeks in the middle of summer, we've had some significant effective oh, yeah. rainfall along mm -hmm. with some thunder and lightning. A great tool that you can use, and it's really effective for times like that when we're getting you know, effective rainfall. That's the key thing to think about. Plus, summer and fall months when we might need to be doing some supplemental watering, but we also still are getting some effective rainfall, you can add a rain sensor to your typical irrigation controller. And what this does, it has some discs inside here that when effective, you know, not just a little sprinkle, it it's not going to really mm -hmm. help your plants much, but it really gets in there and saturates this little disc and you can sort of set it to an eighth, a quarter, a half inch, whatever is work mm -hmm. right for your system. And, and what it will do is basically inhibit the operation of the irrigation system without you having to remember to go turn it off. Oh, that's great. When these discs dry out, after uh, you know 24 hours 36 hours that's kind of where the setting comes in then it resumes functionality and you're back off taking good care of your plants. Ah, that is great. And then what if that's like way over my head? I mean, that's just, I, I can't yeah. do that. I'm, I'm nervous about if it. If any of the things that we're talking about today are you're not comfortable taking that on yourself, by all means hire a landscape contractor that's licensed, bonded, insured in the state of Oregon to do irrigation work. That's really key. If you can, get a couple bids to do the work that you're interested in. Talk to them and then trust your instincts on who to go with. Uh, and really, you have so much information on your website, That's so right. tell us that, that website again. So, regionalh2o.org, we've got some basic information that can help you select a landscape contractor, so check out the website and give us a call if you have any questions. Uh, well, you know, we love having Steve and his crew out here to always tell us about tips, so for more information, go to gardentime.tv and we can click you over to that website and you can really water effectively this season. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching Garden Time. And as you're out in your garden this summer, make sure you take a look at those bats and see the good that they're doing for your garden. And if you have any questions about today's show or any of our shows, please go to gardentime.tv. Ryan and I thank you for watching and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.